the Shiki Science Show clips. Yeah, no, CRISPR has definitely revolutionized, as you say, not only potentially the way we can treat different genetic diseases, but also just as a research tool, um, like uh, with CRISPR screens um, to investigate and understand um, how the cells are working. But um, like with CRISPR-Cas9, the canonical system, in addition to finger nucleases and talons, what they, the way that they work is by inducing double-stranded breaks. And so double-stranded breaks um, are quite deleterious for a cell. It's, you know, it's a major form of damage for a cell. And it's had um, raised concerns in different papers about inducing the DNA damage response um, in terms of the P53 mediated response. And so there's concerns over not only um, basically the safety of having um, an editing machinery that induces a double-stranded break. And so that's led to um, finding solutions that edit without having a double-stranded break that might be potentially safer in case there was any off-target um, editing going on. And so um, was that why you ended up discovering uh, base editing or how did base editing come about? Could you explain a bit about that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question. Um, so as I think you just gave a, uh, a great concise summary of, of uh, double-strand breaks and their role in, in gene editing. Um, you know, it really began with Maria Jason's seminal discovery that a double-strand break uh, can stimulate increased rates of homologous recombination at the cut site. Uh, and because the, the use of the connection between double-stranded breaks, which is cutting a chromosome into two pieces, and gene editing really began with uh, Maria Jason and others discovering the relationship between double-stranded breaks and homologous recombination products, I think there was uh, great hope early on in the gene editing field's history that being able to, to make targeted double-stranded breaks with these programmable nucleases, whether they're zinc finger nucleases or talons or CRISPR-Cas9, um, would provide a way to, to do precise gene correction. Unfortunately, uh, we now know that this process of homology-directed repair, or HDR, as it's called, uh, which is oh, the way that a double-stranded break can be turned into a precise edit, uh, is, is unfortunately not general. And uh, virtually no therapeutically relevant cell types support uh, HDR with an efficiency that would be considered useful. Uh, for at least for therapeutic applications. As a research tool, it, it is widely used and in vitro under a variety of conditions, you can find cells that support HDR. But, you know, perhaps tellingly, uh, I think when I checked uh, last month, uh, so February 2021, uh, somebody asked me how many CRISPR clinical trials are there right now? And the answer is, so I looked it up, there's 43 of them. Uh, how many of them uh, are trying to use a double-stranded break to induce precise gene repair through homology-directed repair? The answer is zero. Uh, all of the therapeutic trials uh, using CRISPR right now um, are using CRISPR to disrupt genes because the branch of fate that happens once you make a double-stranded cut in a chromosome uh, is predominantly in most cell types to, to lead to gene disruption uh, through indel formation, meaning the cell is desperately trying to get the ends of the broken chromosome back together. And in the process, it will uh, often get the ends together perfectly, but then the nuclease can just chop up the, uh, the site again, and you, you go back to the broken chromosome. So every now and then, the act of joining the ends back together makes a mistake, and those mistakes slow down the process of subsequent cutting. So you, you see an accumulation of those dead end products, uh, collectively called indels, because they have insertions and deletions. It's mostly deletions. It should be called del ends. It's just more awkward to say, I suppose. Um, uh, and so to be clear, you know, making indels in a targeted gene uh, can be quite useful, but you have to get kind of lucky if that is your therapeutic strategy. Uh, one really important example where scientists, uh, where biology did provide that luck is uh, sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia, some blood diseases caused by um, homozygous mutations in 
the adult hemoglobin gene called beta globin, uh, you can compensate for those mutations, not by fixing directly the beta globin genes. I mean, you could do that in principle. That's just harder to do it with the nuclease for the reasons we just described. But instead, you can use gene disruption to fix, to rescue some of those diseases by disrupting a gene that is involved in the silencing of fetal hemoglobin. So as I'm sure you know, and, and, and your audience is probably becoming increasingly familiar with, uh, we're born with redundant sets of hemoglobin genes. We have a, a fetal hemoglobin set of genes that uh, is responsible for most of our fe- uh, hemoglobin when, when we are gestating as fetuses. And then around the time of birth, it begins to be silenced and adult hemoglobin gene expression begins to be turned on instead. Uh, so researchers have identified many of the genes involved in silencing that fetal hemoglobin. And if you can disrupt those genes, then you can actually if you disrupt those genes, then you can actually uh, turn back on fetal hemoglobin. And uh, almost everybody who has defective beta globin genes has healthy fetal hemoglobin genes. Uh, so it's probably a reasonably strong selection during embryogenesis. Uh, so so even if you if you lose the genetic lottery and you inherit or are born with two defective adult beta globin genes, you can still lead a normal life if you have mutations that disrupt silencing of fetal hemoglobin. A very lucky number of people, a small, very lucky number of, well, you could argue they're lucky and unlucky, uh, were born with all of those mutations. They have mutations in their adult hemoglobin that should give them serious blood diseases, but they also have mutations in the genes that are necessary to silence fetal hemoglobin, so they end up being okay. Um, And so uh, a bunch of really smart scientists and companies have exploited this observation to use CRISPR-Cas9 or other uh, double-strand break-inducing programmable nucleases to disrupt the, the genes that silence fetal hemoglobin. So that's an example of how gene disruption can actually benefit uh, a patient. But the reason I said you have to get kind of lucky is, um, you know, there are a number of small miracles that all had to take place to create this perfect storm of a situation where gene disruption can rescue a genetic disease. Most of the time, uh, in order to benefit a patient, we need to fix a mutation, not simply disrupt it further. The mutation has already disrupted the gene uh, or, or created a, a version of the gene that leads to health problems. And in most cases, simply disrupting the gene further isn't expected to benefit patients. Instead, we need to mediate precise gene correction instead of gene disruption. So I think that's sort of a background that, um, you know, I, I don't think is a any kind of great new insight. It's it's been known in human genetics for a long time that the nature of most mutations is that they need to be fixed or complemented rather than further disrupted in order to rescue a disease phenotype. Um, but uh, the story about how base editing began uh, then uh, took that background and married it again with the serendipitous um, uh, prospective postdoc candidates application. This is Alexis Comor now a professor at UCSD. Um, Alexis uh, was a prospective postdoc, interviewed in my group. Um, our lab was very impressed with her. Uh, I made her an offer. And as I often do with postdocs, even before they arrive, we began to exchange emails about, okay, what, what projects did you work on? So when they arrive, they can hit the ground running. And, and so I asked her, what are you interested in doing? And, and uh, she uh, emailed me a list of of uh, sort of proto-project ideas, uh, one of which um, I thought was was kind of interesting. She was uh, proposing the use of PUF proteins, which are programmable, sort of programmable RNA binding proteins to mediate um, changes to RNA. And, um, you know, I told her, uh, I think this is interesting, but what would potentially be uh, particularly transformative I think I used uh, uh, fairly grandiose language in my email to her, which I've now uh, been asked to dig up several times uh, by journalists. Um, uh, and th- I think this was back in 2013, so it was a long time ago. 2013, uh, I, I told her, if you can um, uh, develop a way 
to do chemistry directly on a base pair to change one base pair to another base pair in DNA, uh, given the challenges that were beginning to be understood with homology-directed repair and making double-stranded breaks, I think the wording I used was uh, you you could you would transform the life sciences and quite possibly medicine or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> um, and so we began to brainstorm uh, how to do this. And um, uh, you know, she pointed out. Uh, so we quickly focused on cytokine and deaminases. Um, uh, I think I had uh, proposed that she look at uh, some of the enzymes known to turn C's into U's, and U's, of course, pair like T's. Uh, she raised the, I think, very good point that these deaminases seem to work on single-stranded DNA, and of course, most genomic DNA is not single-stranded. Uh, and then, uh, as we thought about what different DNA binding proteins uh, to use, uh, I think in a subsequent email, I pointed out that the, the single-stranded requirement of most deaminases uh, doesn't bother me too much because Cas9 is known to unwind the DNA into single strands into single strands. Uh, and, you know, I think at the time that sort of made logical sense, but uh, I didn't fully appreciate how enabling uh, that uh, simple ability of Cas9 to create a single-stranded DNA R loop uh, when it engages the target DNA sequence uh, was. And, uh, you know, as, as a sort of uh, perfect storm of, of, uh, of molecular interactions, you know, Cas9, because it has to pair the guide RNA, you know, Watson Crick style with one of the target DNA strands, it has to unwind the DNA double helix so that one strand can pair with the guide RNA. And that leaves the other strand as a sort of free single stranded DNA bubble. And it's within that single stranded bubble that base editing occurs on the quote non targeted strand. Uh, so the CRISPR. Uh, biologist named the strand that pairs with the guide RNA as the targeted strand. Um, but for base editing, it's actually the other strand that, that gets edited first. Um, so, so, uh, so that was the basic idea. And we even in early on uh, talked about how we would probably have to impede uh, the uracil DNA glycosylase enzymes that otherwise are very highly evolved to look for uracil in DNA and cut it out because right. cytosine turns out to be the least stable of the four DNA bases. And, uh, you know, your roughly 1 billion cytosines in each of your cells undergo spontaneous deamination uh, at a rate that results in several hundred of them every day becoming uracil. So that would probably be an unacceptable level of mutation uh, were it not for the fact that your cells uh, and I think just about every kind of cell has evolved uh, very efficient mechanisms to constantly look for these uracils in DNA and cut them out and then replace them with Cs. Um, so, uh, so we identified a, a, a small protein inhibitor that would shut down that process called uracil glycosylase inhibitor that we could localize to the side of the base edit to try to block um, uracil glycosylation, at least transiently at that site. Uh, and then the final piece came uh, as an insight that Alexis had uh, following uh, her discussions with other group members. So at that time, we had the cytidine deaminase piece, the Cas9 piece, the, uh, the uracil glycosylase piece, and we were getting, you know, okay amounts of base editing, maybe 10 or 15 percent editing. Uh, thanks to the UGI, it was reasonably clean. Uh, but we were trying to get the process to be more efficient. And, you know, we speculated that the ceiling of efficiency was probably going to be 50% uh, using that architecture, because if you create a UG mispair, the cell has to figure out whether the U is the correct information or the G is the correct information. And it's going to resolve that disagreement either in your favor, creating a UA base pair, which is what you want, or it'll go back to the starting material to create a CG. And, uh, and so we thought, well, maybe we could, and, and this is really the insight that Alexis brought to my attention, that uh, she had a hunch that if you nicked the G-containing strand, that that would cue mismatch repair, which in eukaryotic cells uses nicks to signify newly synthesized and therefore less validated DNA. 
uh, that, that the NIC would cue mismatch repair to replace the segment containing the G with the newly synthesized DNA segment. And because there was a uracil on the opposite side of the double helix, when it was resynthesizing that, that new DNA segment, it would put in an A opposite the U. And that would complete the conversion of the information on both strands uh, to what, you know, from what used to be a CG base pair now to a UA or a TA base pair. And so that adding that simple NIC, which required just a single mutation put back into, uh, into our BE2 base editor, resulted in BE3, which was the first you know, reasonably efficient cytosine base editor. And, and we showed that it was now able to, I think in our original paper, you know, edit 30 or 40%, sometimes 70%, uh, but clearly showing you could, you could actually exceed 50% editing by biasing that uh, mismatch repair process, which would otherwise, to a first approximation, be a coin toss, to instead favor the repair of both DNA strands the way you wanted. Um, and now, of course, uh, base editors have been improved by many labs, including our own, over many generations. And uh, you know, we've uh, in some recent experiments we, that multiple people in the lab have done at multiple different target sites for multiple. Uh, uh, genetic diseases, they get close to 100% editing. So it's really come a long way. And, you know, there were, uh, in fact, a new first year graduate student named Lily in the lab has achieved 100% editing at multiple target sites, uh, in, including in, in patient derived, uh, in patient fibroblasts, primary fibroblasts. So, uh, so base editing has come a long way. And, and there were moments early on, even right when we published the paper in 2016. Where we wondered, are we ever going to be able to achieve, you know, 80, 90, 100% editing? Even though I think for the vast majority of genetic diseases to benefit patients, you don't need editing that efficient. Um, but the answer actually is yes, you can get close to 100% base editing using the variety of improvements that the community uh, have now advanced uh, from our original work in 2016. And I should also mention that uh, two groups in Japan, uh, professors Nishida and Kondo working together, reported in Science uh, several months after our initial base editor paper that Alexis led, uh, reported in Science uh, a similar system where they used a different deaminase, uh, but also with Cas9, also nicking the opposite strand, uh, and reported similar results. So uh, that was also welcome news because it really showed that um, uh, that, you know, independent groups were, were finding the same uh, outcomes that you could now make for the first time targeted single base pair changes without cutting the DNA double helix, without cutting a chromosome into pieces uh, in a living mammalian cell, in a, in a living human cell. And that really, of course, got us uh, fixated on, okay, uh, let's figure out how to, how to fix as many possible types of mutations that are responsible for genetic disease and that researchers might want to install in cells to study uh, the properties of genes uh, as possible. But the boundary conditions are you can't make double-stranded breaks. Well, no, that's really incredible to hear the, the backstory to how base editing started. And it's incredible also to hear that you're approaching 100% efficiency. Um, which is definitely um, pretty amazing considering um, like where it started with. Um, and so obviously you've now taken um, base editing uh, to Beam Therapeutics, which you co-founded and you're trying to now take um, the, the basic science um, discovery and taking it to being able to treat different genetic diseases. And so um, out of the different genetic diseases, what, um, what do you think base editing will be used for first in terms of getting to uh, patients in the clinic? Yeah, well, so Beam has disclosed a variety of, of programs that they uh, plan to bring to the clinic uh, this year or shortly thereafter. Uh, and uh, based on their announcements, uh, they've disclosed that they are uh, they have developed base editing strategies to treat uh, some blood diseases. Uh, they've uh, developed base editing to base editing strategies to uh, treat some metabolic diseases as well, like um, alpha alpha one antitrypsin uh, deficiency. Uh, 
Uh, and I think they've also disclosed that they have uh, been able to base edit to correct some genetic alleles that are involved in uh, some uh, blindness diseases as well. Uh, uh, I, I always want to make sure that uh, uh, anything I'm sharing is something that they've already shared. So uh, uh, just point people to the, the Beam Therapeutics website where they, I think, list the programs that they publicly disclose. Uh, but I think maybe from a, from a more meta perspective, uh, you know, a, a decision that I admire that, that Beam has made is uh, they recognize that the platform was so broad in its potential applicability to diseases, that they would not focus on just one organ, one type of disease, one delivery modality. But instead, uh, Beam has, I think, done a great job trying to advance as many programs as possible to cover the broadest possible range of, of diseases and therefore of patients that could benefit from base editing technology. And so they have uh, really chosen to, uh, to pursue uh, as many programs that meet, um, you know, some key criteria, like is there bulletproof biology that relates the correction of the mutation to the correction of the disease? Uh, is there a delivery modality that can, uh, that is promising to deliver the base editors to the cells that are anticipated to uh, lead to uh, disease rescue if corrected? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, what are the... Uh, uh, what are the potential base editing strategies that can fix the mutation with the best current base editing technologies known? And, you know, fortunately, I think is a sign of, of the progress that has led to literally hundreds of base editors now being published, uh, having been published. Um, uh, that third criteria is increasingly proving easier and easier to meet. Uh, that with all of the different Cas9 PAM variants, uh, the different Cas proteins that have proven to be compatible with base editors, including a variety of Cas12 uh, variants, um, uh, that uh, targeting is is increasingly uh, uh, not an issue, and uh, and even sort of positioning the target nucleotide with respect to the base editing window has also been simplified, not just by the fact that there are now lots of different PAM sequences that you can target, uh, that is lots of places in the genome where you can park a base editor, but researchers have had started to have some uh, success uh, controlling where the base editing window is and how wide or how narrow it is. And so that diversity of literally hundreds of base editors that are available now um, greatly increases the chance that if you have a mutation you're trying to correct, uh, you can do so with uh, with a base editor without too much trouble. Wow, that is super exciting. Because, yeah, that's one of, um, obviously, the concerns with base editing is you obviously have Cas9 coming into the DNA site, opening up the DNA region. And obviously, in theory, there could be um, potential for off-target editing of different sites. So having control over that window is a great advance. Right. And, and uh, researchers have shown that you can both mutate the deaminases to uh, control that window, and you can also mutate the Cas9. And in, in maybe intellectually, at least my favorite solution, you can circularly permute Cas9 proteins, something that uh, Dave Savage has had success with. And so we collaborated with, with his lab and showed that these circularly permuted Cas9s do indeed change enough the topology of the R loop relative to the deaminase that you can uh, move, uh, in some cases broaden, in other cases actually move over uh, the base editing window. Um, so uh, so having a, a sort of bookshelf with lots and lots of different books that each have slightly different properties has proven to be uh, especially useful for enabling base editing to um, serve as many purposes as possible at as, at as many target sites as as, po as possible with as many performance characteristics as is needed to enable the research or the therapeutic application of interest.